So you've been involved in some of <coughs> Europe's best or most notable tech successes. Currently Spotify, uh, Sumly with Nick Delosio. Uh, you are an advisor to one of the world's richest men, Li Ka-shing. Um, all of this and you haven't finished high school. We'll get to that later. But I want to know, first of all, what it is you do. Because you seem to be everywhere and yet you have a relative low profile. So, so what is your job? I guess the easiest way to explain the title had a special project that I don't actually like sitting around in offices pretending to be busy. The benefit of that is if you look at companies today versus five or ten years ago, a typical tech company would start off in Silicon Valley, three years later they'd go, we need to go international, and they'd hire somebody who'd done a summer in France and go, why don't you go run our European operations and put them in London, not realizing that isn't the right way to do it. <clears throat> so some of the stuff which I tend to do, which is where a special project comes in, is being the eyes and ears for a CEO. If you're a CEO of a fast-growing company, there's only so many hours in the day, and they're all taken up. And you go from being a one-man band with an idea, or one-man woman, or two-man team, a very small team, to building out your product, actually becoming a manager because you've got to scale this and you've got to hire the right people. Mm -hmm. Part of the entrepreneurial drive or those risks that you wanted to take no longer can be taken because you're stuck in trying to build this organization. I act as a great support role for CEOs at that stage. And I'll give you an example. Spotify is in a number of countries around the world, over 50, but there's 100 and something, 90 countries around the world. Probably Let's say if you take the top 80 countries, and if we're in the top 55 or 56, out of the remaining 24, I have probably already been to most of those countries two years ago and built the relationships. And I want to touch upon that is a lot of the stuff which I do is relationship building. There's a big difference between relationship building and networking. Right? So I'll go to a country two years before Spotify even deploys the first person there and start working out who we need to have relationships with, who we should be hiring, who we should be buying. And it's kind of the, uh, you know, the forward advance party for a CEO. Mm -hmm. And that seems to work very well in tech companies because they want to do everything yesterday. And I can just take so much luggage or baggage from a CEO. So that's one thing. And then the other thing to that would be what makes me qualified to do that <coughs> is having built, run, and sold multiple businesses Whilst I may not be an expert at PR, I've probably hired or fired many PR agencies. So again, you, you take a country like Korea, for example, I could go there, at least I know where to start looking. So it just ends up being a far easier approach that in two years later, when the Spotify team lands on the ground, they at least have a warm welcoming and they have a document which states who they need to be talking to. But how do you know what decisions to make? How, how do you know what path to take in a situation like that? Because you know, building startups, the advice is, is famously, you know, fail fast. Like, try something. If it doesn't work, you know, try something else. Your job is to figure out what will work in advance of that. Well, you take risks, right? You're taking risks. So it's not as if I'm going. I'm going to go and move to South America for 12 months or for 18 months. I may go and spend a week in a country. And luckily, having a great network of people around the world who have built relationships with, it becomes very easy for me. So I touched on this uh, in, in the intro there. Uh, you didn't finish school, so you, you mm -hmm. actually left school before 16. Yeah. Is that right? I did. Which is amazing, and that, that's probably a story in itself. Not if you ask my mom. Uh, my uh, mom uh, still uh, wishes uh, I'd turn up one day and go, hey, I'm going back to school to get my GCSEs. So. Yeah. so that's basically the secret, I guess, for this business school is, you know, just, just stop school and... and no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Carolyn is going to fire me. Yeah, you know, you know. um, yeah, okay, so how do you get from a dropout to, you know, one of the most successful young entrepreneurs, internet entrepreneurs in London? I thought about this question long and hard because I knew you were going to answer this. And the truth of it is a lot of pain, a lot of sleepless nights, 
a lot of dreams, a lot of books. And you take those four things and you work at so I grew up in the equivalent of, you know, very working class neighborhood where you're basically stuck there for life. You're not getting out. <clears throat> and it was something which I wasn't willing to accept. So it really is those four things. Pain, dreams, books, lack of sleep, and this hunger. Right. And that's what keeps you going. So, you know, I used to dream a lot. Um, and I still do. Passes the time away. But, you know, when you come from an environment like that, Dreams, and you know, I'm not trying to go philosophical here, but dreams are a very powerful thing, right? Because they allow you to escape reality. So, you know, you can put your you can put your mind somewhere that you know I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to accept what the current situation is. And then along with it is, you know, you, it's certainly not going to change. You always got to put the work in. You've got to go through the pain points, and you know that includes the sleepless nights and the various mistakes you make along the way, but it was really this hunger and drive mm -hmm. of, I'd made this decision at the age of 15 and nine months or whatever that this is the path I was going to take. Right. Right. And then there was no going back to that. So I'd already left one path. I didn't want to kind of go, well, I left that and that didn't quite work out and here I am, 25. Right. So there was no other option. I, it was either get to where I want to get or die. Simple. That's how I look at it. <laughs> So, when you put it like that, <laughs> I can see why you're motivated. Um, so, tell me about that first business. How long after, after leaving school did you decide to launch a business? So, I have to differentiate between ideas and businesses, because I still come up with about three ideas a day. And Will, who's sitting there, busy on his phone, who works with me, I, I literally come up with three ideas a day, and I'll call the team in, and I'll, you know, the thing, right, he's off again, and then about three hours later, I've forgotten the idea. But some actually end up being businesses. <laughs> One of the first real business I had, I guess, I was 21, 22, was buying second-hand mobile phones. So this is 1994, 1995. Buying second-hand mobile phones in the UK. There used to be a newspaper called Loot, and I basically drive around, mm -hmm. buying people's broken phones, stay up at night. There's something called Back to Black, which is used to polish car dashboards. So you take Back to Black, and you use that to polish the phones, because in those days, all phones are black. I'd stay up, wait till about 3 o'clock, go to sleep for about 3 hours, and then I'd drive to Stansted Airport and take the 7.55 flight to Dublin, because prices of phones in Dublin were three times the price of London. And I was literally one of these salesmen with a little suitcase, and I'd walk up and down the street to the shops selling phones. I'd get paid in cash, and I used to count that cash in the men's toilets at Dublin Airport, and many times... I got stopped because I didn't realize they have CCTV <laughs> looking at them. What's this guy doing? Like, literally putting out notes there. And I would get back on the flight, come back, like, land at 7 p.m., yeah. and get in the car, not go home, right. but drive around all day or all evening, buying phones up again. So oh, that's incredible. So, how do you get from that to the internet? <clears throat> um, so, I've never switched on a computer. I really didn't know much about computers. But late 90. <clears throat> 899, you know, got myself this Olivetti Ecos P100D laptop. I'm like, okay, this looks like fun. And then AOL chat rooms and CompuServe actually before that. So I'm like, I need to get into this. And the first company was a domain name company. And it was just registering domain names, and that allowed me to understand a bit more about how the internet worked. Second company was actually Europe's first free SMS service. Think of WhatsApp, but like 12 years or 14 years ago. It was just way, way too early. Wow. Right. Um, and I managed somehow to launch it on CNN Breakfast News with Becky Anderson in front of 36 million people. I just kind of cold called out of the blue, and this is 2000. I was like, well, you're running a tech company? Yeah, great. Come on the show tomorrow morning. I had no media training. I borrowed my brother's suit because I assumed, like, you're going to CNN. You have to wear a suit. It was one size too big for me. And I went and launched it, and it was doing great. And then the crash happened, right? and I lost every penny. I didn't know what, uh, you know, I hadn't taken any funding. I had no idea where Silicon Valley was, and I kid you not, I thought M&A was actually spelled Mike November Alpha. I didn't know what mergers and acquisitions were, so there I am, right? and I'm back in square one. But I've had the taste of it, and I'm like, I can't go back to that life. Yeah. And then, you know, you come up with ideas to counteract that, and many businesses later, here we are. 
And so, which one was buy at? Because that's the one so, that yeah. so eventually sold to AOL. Yeah. So this was a consumer finance lead generation company. I'd moved to China after doing a few things, went traveling around the world, got bored, moved to China, learned some Chinese, and like, okay, I'll start a little business which makes some pocket money so I can stay in China and never have to go back to the uh, UK and work again. And very rapidly realized this was going to be a huge business, and it was never meant to be a huge business. I came back, hired my old team back, yes. <laughs> and literally nine months later, we sold to a uh, buyer. So we had a company called Lightstay there, buyer, we sold to them, and it was a consumer finance lead generation company, very similar to Money Supermarket. And then nine months later, buyer was bought out by AOL. So I actually had two exits. All my life I'd been waiting for like this amazing work to exit, and then the two exits came from something which was a total random idea. I never thought it was going to be a big business. Okay. So that was for a reported $100 million or thereabouts. I won't embarrass you by asking how much of that went into your bank account, but I'm imagining it was a, it was a fair chunk. Um, what happens when you go from being a kid who's starting out a business to ha suddenly having a lot of money? It's a very lonely and depressing place. And I realized, and I genuinely mean this, ever since I was a kid, to me, money was the solution to many problems, right? Poverty, education, etc., etc. So you obsess about, I need to make lots of money, I need to make lots of money. And then you make this money, and then the next day was probably the most depressing day of my life because I realized <clears throat> the money was very important, right? But it was that hunger and that journey that kept me going, and now suddenly you refresh the bank account and there's lots and lots of zeros there, and you're like, okay, but what do you want me to do? Go and sit in a strategy meeting with some guys at AOL who don't really know what they're doing? And this is actually, it was around this time that I met Daniel Ek, and funnily enough, considering he was only 22 or 23 at the time, he'd actually sold a company at the age of 20 and gone through it. So he'd phone me up going, hey, you depressed yet? And I'm like, kind of. He said, bought a new car yet? And I'm like, looking at one today, he said, oh, you'll get bored of it next week. And this is how our relationship actually started. So even though he was younger than me, he'd gone through it, and he found in me somebody else who could actually relate to this conversation. Right. So did he have the idea for Spotify at the time? Was yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he'd already you know, got a small team, him, him and uh, Martin Lawrence, and, and they had a small team already up and running out in Sweden. Okay. So he had built Stardo before, yeah. right? So, so Daniel Lack, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is a successful uh, Swedish uh, internet entrepreneur who, who built Stardoll first, which was basically designing dolls. Paper hey, dolls hey, online. Yeah. Um, and actually was not that big of a musa. It wasn't really that crazy about music himself necessarily, but saw, saw that something need, needed to happen, that people were not, not as interested in, in buying CDs anymore, which we could all see. But he had this idea that you could make music free and you know, make it freely available in the way that it was uh, on Napster and those sorts of sites, but get the backing of the music industry. So I guess what he was trying to achieve was, how do you make a product which is actually better than piracy, yeah. legal, and free? Right. Three big challenges. But to get the buy-in from the music industry was a huge thing, because they had been fighting piracy, and so much of the, you know, the record labels, you know, diminishing revenues come from physical sales, right? So this meant taking a huge chance. You, in a way, you invested in Spotify, so you weren't just friends with, with Daniel Lack. No, I actually wrote, it's funny, it's my first ever investment. And, you know, I went and talked to a lot of professional investors and VCs, and hey, there's this guy who's got this idea, and everyone said to me, don't invest in this company. No, you're crazy. We've been doing this for 20 years, and... We're experts at M&A or M&A, whatever you want to call it. Trust <laughs> us, we know all about this. Don't touch it with a barge pole. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put probably most of my net worth into this company. And, you know, are you crazy? Didn't you hear what you said? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not backing a music product. I'm backing an entrepreneur called Daniel Eck. And I want to touch on that. So Daniel used to come over to London, and after a while he's crashing my spare room. And I'd get up at like 3 a.m. to go get some water. And I'd walk past, and he's there on his laptop. And I'd wake up at 7 o'clock, and you walk past, and he's basically asleep with the laptop on him. And you realize, coming back to what I said earlier, this guy's going to succeed, right. or he's going to die. There is no other options. And having been through that, and that hunger that he had, to me, it was the absolute right decision to invest. And it was done, never done in the sense of, if I invest X, I may get you know, multiple FX, it was like, 
here's a guy who's got a huge dream, much bigger than any of my dreams ever were, and I want to back him, and hopefully I'll get to go along for the ride, which I did, which I am. Yeah. Um, so, so Spotify still today remains uh, controversial, but I think it, it, it definitely is successful, at, at least in terms of, in the eyes of consumers. You when know? did you last buy a CD? Answer that question. Uh, actually, you're asking the wrong guy. I bought, oh, you buy I CDs? Bought, I bought the Natalie Merchant CD. Who's Natalie Merchant? We gotta have this conversation <laughs> offline. Cool. Um, but but you know that's that's a separate conversation because I, I I love music. Um, but I I'm a big backer of Spotify. I I subscribe to Spotify and I still buy physical CDs. So uh, or actually more 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 than often I buy vinyl. Uh, but why do you think Daniel Ek and and the rest of you at Spotify were able to convince the record companies to buy into this idea? You know it took a long time, right? It was not a walk in the park. So the first license which were granted were in Sweden, small, you know, very developed nation with fast internet. And if you look at the top 10 countries of revenue for music globally, it probably not in the top 10, you know. And it was a test case. I actually think it was a test case yeah. to be able to prove to them, that, hey, we think this will work. And they're like, okay, you're in a little silo over here in Scandinavia. Most people in LA don't really know the difference between Switzerland, Swedish, Sweden, or Swiss. I kid you not, right? So, you know, you're so isolated because they go to me and say, hey, how's it going in Switzerland? So, we're not from Switzerland, we're from Sweden. They're like, yeah, over there somewhere. And then it took off there. Had we tried launching this company in the USA, there was no way this company was going to launch. Right. So whilst it was tough for us, it was actually that kind of semi-stealth move, which yeah. wasn't deliberate, it just happened that the company was in Sweden, did us a lot of favors. Okay. So we started in Sweden, and then it was Norway, and then Finland, and maybe the UK came first. And that's when you started seeing, and there were a lot of things that went in our favor. Right? So smartphones came out, broadband, 3G, a lot of things, just the stars aligned right. in a positive way. And you had some fairly significant people in Silicon Valley get interested, fall in love with Spotify, and really back it. So including Sean Parker, who of course was the guy, one of the co-creators of Napster, uh, the first president of Facebook, um, and Mark Zuckerberg um, said he loved Spotify, it was so good, and, and basically integrated it, it into Facebook. I understand that you Put, made the initial introduction between Sean Parker and, and Daniel Leck. That's, that's a historic moment. So tell me about that. Um, so coming back to the special projects, because it's very relevant, <clears throat> one of my things, one of my roles was to make sure that the right people in the USA know about Spotify. And it's easy now to be able to email Sean and go, hey, Sean, how's it going? And he'll answer, but you know, you're a small Swedish company startup, everyone's trying to reach these people. So there are a few key journalists and influencers who have managed to help get you know, prior access to us launching. Right. And there was a gentleman by the name of Jeff Rosenthal who runs the Summit series. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get him prior access with approval from Daniel and the team. And he was having a barbecue. And Sean Parker apparently walks in there. He's like, hey, where's this music coming from? There's this company called Spotify. And he's like, yeah, I've heard of this, but I can't get an account. They're in Sweden, and it never works because he was trying to, you know, spoofing IPs and VPN. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the guys like, well, hey, have a play around with it. So he plays around with it, and you know, falls in love with it because he's now seen how good the product was, and says, oh, could you introduce me to the guys? So Jeff knew me, didn't know Daniel, so he introduced me to um, Sean. I in turn gave Sean a um, account because he was somebody we wanted. And then suddenly he started sending these really long emails like, you know, ever since I was a child I've waited for this moment. I kid you not, I had no idea who Sean Parker was. Yeah. Right? And he'd start sending these really, really long emails. And, uh, one day I said to Daniel, I've got this kind of like psycho dude who just rambles on about, you know, ever since he called him Napster and this is how it was, what it was meant to be, et cetera, et cetera. So he said Sean Parker and he said, well, don't you know? So, well, I only knew Sean Fanning, right? Because yeah. Sean Fanning had the name. Right. Anyway, I introduced him to Daniel, the rest is history. He doesn't send me those long emails now, he sends them to Daniel. I see, okay. Um, so let's move on to some of the other companies. Uh, first, I guess we have to go to Horizons Ventures, right? So, uh, Li Ka Shing, uh, as we say, one of the most successful, uh, richest men in the world, uh, is an investor 
uh, became later an investor in Sumly. So in, in Nick Delosio's company, Nick is a lovely kid who I think is now 18, 18? 18? Uh, but started a company, or actually started designing apps uh, from his home in, 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 when he was 12. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. And then, and then I think he created Sumly when he was 15, right? right? So, so um, how, how were you introduced to Nick? Because I know that for a time you were traveling the world with Nick. Um, and then he had the successful exit, which was you know, selling Sumly to, to Yahoo for a reported $30 million. Pretty good for about a, you know, a few years' work, but Sumly had not been around that long. So Mr. Lee and Horizons were early investors or you know, B-round investors in Spotify, and I managed a lot of the investor relations. Got to know them over the years, and you know, built up a relationship with them, and they called me up one day and said, hey, you know, we invest a lot of companies, we found this kid in London, we think he's quite special, yeah. will you meet him? So, yeah. so, can you meet him tomorrow morning or Saturday morning? So I'll meet Nick, so Nick turns up, and we have this conversation, and you realize this kid was exceptional. Yeah. Right? His vision, his IQ and EQ was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And Horizons had invested in this, and they realized you've got a very smart kid with a great idea, some technology, etc. But you, how do you take this to the next level? Right. And so I guess the meeting was for me to see Nick and get excited, and for Nick to meet me. Um, the funny thing about it is, I sat there with Nick and just kind of, you know, just gave him the direct what I thought, you know, the non-bullshit approach. And thought, right, he's going to go away and send him an email going, this guy's an asshole, I never want to meet him again. He goes back and sends him an email and says, hey, I really like this guy. He's the only one who's kind of told me the truth so far of how tough this is going to be. Do you reckon he'll be one of my mentors? And that's how I got involved with Nick Deloisio's company. Wow. And what, what did you do to help him as you traveled around? Because I know that you met a lot of interesting people. Yeah. You, you know, you... you told me a story one time about sort of bumping into Marissa Meyer and the... So we were at DLD. We were at DLD in Munich in January a couple of years ago and Nick was doing a talk there. Um, and his mother was very worried that he was traveling on his own because being a 16-year-old kid. So one of my responsibilities was make sure he's not at all the tech after parties getting drunk. And he needs to be in bed. So we'd done the talks all day. And I'm like, Nick, there's at all conferences, there's bunch of VCs who are having parties and dinners, so we've got to go to like three different parties tonight. So, all right, I'm going to tag along. The first one was Wellington Partners, who are also Spotify investors, and I think the next one was someone else, and then the third one was the Axel Partners, and Marissa was there. And I knew Marissa, you know, I bumped into her a few times before, and I walked up and said, hi, and Nick was with me, meet Nick Deloisio. And, you know, that's how he got to know. That is by no means where the conversation for Sumley 18 months later even started, but at least there was an interaction. So I guess a lot of it is helping Nick hire some of the right people and not make some of the same mistakes everyone else along the way has made, you know, growing too fast or outsourcing X or when it came to um, the investment round that we did, yeah. I helped introduce Nick to a number of investors who invested in the company. Yeah, so he had like an all-star list of investors. like. Marty Pincus from Zynga, yeah, Joint Ashton, Shields. to Troy Carter. Ashton, yeah. yeah. Um, so some of those people I introduced him to. Yeah. And did it matter to him that you had, in a way, had an experience where you were out on your own? Because he, he basically, he didn't leave school altogether. He was still studying, but he had one of those kind of star actor sort of deals, like kid yeah. actor deals, where he went to school. I don't think not that was so relevant because Nick truly is exceptional. He has a conversation like a 45-year-old, right? So it's not, you're not dealing with a 16-year-old kid. I'm 43, yeah. and actually I don't think I can have a conversation like that. No, he is exceptional. I guess there were other things. Uh, one of the actually other uh, things, it was very similar to the Daniel Egg process, right? So because I'd gone through a certain amount of my time spending a lot of time with Daniel helping grow the company and go to the USA. So, so a lot of similarities there. I remember I took him to Stockholm to meet Daniel and they hung out for an hour and in like one on one yeah. and you know it was a great line Daniel uh, said to him which I'll never forget when you're a 16 year old kid and you're trying to build a company a lot of people will go to you and you're a seasoned entrepreneur you go well you know you're a kid let me explain to you Daniel said to him you know Nick 
entrepreneur to entrepreneur. And I'll never forget that line because it takes a lot of balls by yeah. anyone to say to a 16-year-old that I'm regarding you as an equal. On the flip side, from Nick's aspect as well, he then realized I'm not being treated like a kid. And the tech world actually has this. Age really isn't that much of a barrier if you've got the talent. The only thing you can really tease Nick for is being a, an Arsenal fan, in my view. But actually, yeah. after, <laughs> after the FA Cup, yeah, I'm not sure if you can really get to them. Okay, so uh, let's move on to Coindesk. Coindesk. You were the first person who told me about Bitcoin um, in a cafe uh, not far from where we live. And, and I, I was interested because I've heard of most things, I think, when it comes to tech. You know, you, there's so much moving around on blogs these days, and it's, it's pretty easy to pick things up. Uh, and that's I say, you know, quite often you'll tell me about things that I'm not aware of. Um, what was it you saw? In Bitcoin, that made in, in other kind of cryptocurrencies that made you feel that there was a, a transformative opportunity there. Well, you realise after you've you know, been in the tech world for a certain amount of time, there's stuff that was taking place yesterday, there's stuff that's taking place today, but you know your risk appetite gets better, and then you start thinking, well, what's it going to be like in five years' time? So you know, if you take a prime example of financial services versus what we're living today. Why is it that I can send you a text message, photo message, a video message, a voice message from my phone, from my smartphone to your smartphone, it'll take you like three seconds, but you turn around to me and go, hey Shaq, you owe me 12 bucks for that pizza we shared last week. I'm like, well, you know what, let me go home, let me try and wire this money to you, and God forbid you happen to be in the USA, for me to send you that 12 pounds, they're gonna charge me another 27 pounds in transfer fee for you to get it. So you realize there's something very broken. Then you start looking into it, well, the financial systems are actually the same similar systems that they were using in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. You take that. So yes, I'm a believer in Bitcoin, but I'm more a believer in digital currency or financial services being disrupted. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is the first thing that caught my eye that, okay, this may be the one. So part of it's like, I guess, you know, you've been a fax machine salesman in the 90s or 80s, and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, faxes are going to be dead soon. It wouldn't mean everyone uses faxes, all contracts. Well, check this thing out called email, right? You'd right. be blown away. Right. Imagine if you could now go back and have invested in the first email company. Yeah. Right? And if that's what your job was, to take big risks, and back people doing crazy stuff, you would have backed email. No. But did you did you kind of hedge by by launching Coindesk no, no, no. as so opposed to Coindesk actually is a really fun thing. I was actually with Nick and we were in Hong Kong airport. We just sold so Yahoo. Tell me what Coindesk is first. So Coindesk um, is basically a media platform. Originally it was an idea to have a blog which talked about Bitcoin. Twelve months later, it's a team of fifteen people discussing. It's all editorial driven information driven and price driven. So we've created the Coindesk Bitcoin price index, which you know takes in all the prices because there's such a wide gap between one exchange and another exchange and you know we present our own price thing kind of like the Dow Jones uh, price on the stock market. But we're in Hong Kong and the price had just shot up to I believe 260 from 30 or 60 or whatever. And I was getting continuous emails from people going, hey should I buy Bitcoin, should I sell Bitcoin, etc. I'm like, I don't know why you're asking me this, you know, because you're far smarter than me. And then I realized there was nobody writing about it. There was nowhere you could go and understand about Bitcoin or digital currency in plain English. Mm -hmm. So I stayed awake on the plane all night, came back, called the team, and said, I have this idea. Why don't we hire one writer and launch this blog called Coindesk? They're like, okay, but we've never done media. We don't really know. Is there one of your crazy ideas or do you want us to do it? I'm like, <laughs> you have four weeks to launch it. And we launched it four weeks, eight hours, 22 minutes later. Uh, on 1st of May, and you know what we're in, we're in May now, and so it's just over 12 months old, and yeah, it's, it's by far the leading source of information. And it, we've built a great brand, and I, I don't actually spend much time on it. I guess I'm the chief strategy officer and chairman and founder, but there's a whole team that runs it. And again, it's one of those which I didn't expect to be a business, it was just an idea. What do, you, what do you think about cryptocurrencies or these sorts of currencies? What is the future? Because obviously they've had a bit of a wild ride in terms of value over the last year. You know financial services are going to get changed. You know, if I could predict the exact thing, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be busy investing in everything I had in those companies. But, you know, it's just not about the actual Bitcoin. It's 
what else can the platform that's being created end up becoming. Mark Andreessen, who's far smarter and far better investor than me, has done a couple of great talks lately where he talks about where he sees this going. Chamath, who was one of the head guys at Facebook, um, he just did a talk. And, you know, there are two videos well worth talking about. So when you've got people way smarter than me, I'm not nowhere as smart as them. I like to give them the platform. Yeah. And then, hey, sometimes I'm a bit too early. But, you know, it's interesting to be able to see that maybe I was thinking along the same lines a lot of other people. Have you heard of the website, What's Your Wearable Strategy? No. Do you have a wearable know. strategy? Because yeah. I've, I've got a wearable yeah, yeah, right absolutely. now. I have a wearable strategy. It's gone horribly wrong. But, you know, I invested in a company and then we spent uh, quite a bit of time on it. And you realize the devices that are out now probably aren't going to be the devices that go mass market in a few years. But, hey, you know, you take a risk, right? You take a risk and sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. So two quick things before we go to questions. Um, you know, I mentioned the wearables. You know, I, I thought that was like the the shortest lived next big thing ever because Nike, of course, sort of stopped let making, people yeah. go. You know, who are designing the Nike Fuel Band and said they're going to focus on software. It may just be that they're throwing themselves uh, into whatever Apple is software going to next. Or the, yeah. The um, so how do you how do you decide now that you have a lot more at stake? You are successful. What crazy idea you're going to put your money into? and your, your energy into? So there's a number of factors. The founder I've discussed, right, this yeah. passion, hunger, you know, that's very critical, as is the founding team. The idea is very relevant, like somebody comes to me going, hey, you know, awesome founder, going, let's open a coffee shop. It's pretty obvious how big that coffee shop can get on its own unless you want to build a new generation, you know, virtual coffee shop somewhere, and that's a very different scenario. Um, but ultimately what you're doing is you're buying risk right? so this is how I look at it here's an idea here's the value and let's use a number the company is being valued at 5 million they're trying to raise 100 grand or a million bucks or whatever I have to do a calculation to an extent in my head where can this go right? can this be a 100 million dollar company if all the pieces come in yeah. okay, well okay so I am buying risk at 5 to 100 right? Five percent, and that's a risk I'm quite happy with, especially if I think I can help getting him from the five million to a hundred million. The other part, which I guess is slightly different with me, is I don't have to invest. If you look at my personal investments, I'm not a fund. I don't have limited partners. Well, like, hey, we gave you a hundred million dollars. Why aren't you investing in the next Tinder or the next Snapchat, etc.? Like, well, I like some stuff, and I'll invest in it. I like some stuff, and you know, it may go horribly wrong. So I've got very different strategy, and my strategy, by the way, isn't proven yet, right? We may be talking in two years' time. You're like, hey, Shaq, you're a minicab driver in London. What happened? I went, well, it all went wrong. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back. So, hey, you know, what I say, take it with a pinch of salt, right? Yeah. So, yes, it, there is this perceived success. Do I sit there going, hey, I made it? No, because the day I say that is the day I go back into depression. So there's always this hunger of going, well, I kind of got lucky, right? Like yeah. With Spotify, I don't actually f feel... I contributed too much. I'm just very grateful that Daniel X saw my craziness. And I go, okay, there's this crazy guy who doesn't know much about tech, wants to give me most of his net worth. Yeah, let's take the money. Yeah. And allowed me to go and talk to crazy people like Sean Parker. So but let's see what happens. If Spotify were to have an IPO, how far away would that be? I couldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, one last question before we go to the audience. Um, for people who are wanting to be part of a, a startup, Right? Because there's just so much energy in London right now. What would your advice be? What, what's the best way to get involved with something that you think is exciting? Yeah. Startups come in different shapes and forms, and it's what you can contribute to that ecosystem <coughs> or the team. I probably meet about 300 entrepreneurs a year, maybe more, maybe less, maybe 600, who knows, like a couple a day. Um, <clears throat> and every entrepreneur and every founder, one of the biggest things is, I just can't hire the smartest people. I'm having problems hiring. You know? On the flip side, you meet amazingly sharp students. I'm like, you know, I would love to work for a startup, but I can't even get a door in because I turn up and they're like, well, you don't have any experience, right? So we're going to take... So there's this divide um, which needs solving. And then combined with the best candidates I've seen as startups in an early stage, like, 
hey, you know what, I believe in what you're doing, I'm just going to turn up, and if you want me to clean you know, the desks, I'll do that, I just want to learn this. You have to kind of unlearn everything that you did in a corporate environment to go and work in a startup. And, you know, I will rephrase again regarding Will, who's not on his phone this time, who works with me. Will joined as a research assistant about a year ago, because, you know, I get to meet all these amazing companies, and sometimes it's good for me to go, hey, Will, I'm meeting this company tomorrow. Get me everything that you can on them, right? So he'd give me this. He joined as a researcher in kind of a boutique consultancy. He probably does more startup work now than he expected, right? Yeah. Purely because he came on board and he's like, hey, well, check this out and check that. And this company's similar to that. So what I'm trying to get to is just saying I need to work in a startup is not the thing. Find really cool companies. Find something you believe in. And then just reach out, right? Reach out. I mean, as an investor or an entrepreneur, I have so many ideas if they were smart people. That, you know, I would love to hire somebody who would go, you know, I don't know what we're going to build, but there's all these crazy ideas. Why don't we spend four weeks on each project for the next 12 months? And you know out of those 12 projects, something good's going to come out of it. So do I have the solution? No, but what I do know is every company is looking for smart people. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you get there? And then the final touch I will say is, don't waste your time going to networking events because they mean absolutely zero. Because I sit on the other side of companies and some guy walks in going, yeah, 15 students harassed me and they all gave me their details. Yeah, here's their you know, new business cards I'm going to throw away. Right. Reach out to the founder. I've, I've given jobs to people. Not by fax. By email. I've given the job to a guy, Mark Williamson, who then ended up running some of the special projects. Now does the artist relations and label relations. And he reached out to me and said, hey, Shaq, sorry to trouble you. I appreciate you're a busy guy. Just looked at all the jobs at Spotify. I don't think I'm suitably qualified for any of them. <laughs> but, you know, I really want to work and I'm willing to do anything. Is there any role that you think would be suitable? And I was like, you know what? I need somebody to help me get my shit done. If you want to come on board, I can't promise where this ends up. But it's a really cool role and it's a great entry point. And he joined and like six months later, I'm like, hey, you run this. I've got no desire to run it, right? So it worked for him. It's worked for many other people. Listen, I, I want to say heartfelt thanks. That was truly no, inspiring thank you. I and, it. and really wonderful to have you.